nonsense, but since <laughs> the massive giant space. I wrote an article in Ad Astra, um, must have been the issue before last, and I volunteered to come to this conference and give a half hour talk about that article. Uh, I then learned two days ago that my half hour was an hour and that my talk was called Moon Colony. Uh, it's all irrelevant because my job right now doesn't allow me to prepare for talks anyway. So uh, it, it really doesn't matter what I'm supposed to talk about. You're going to get whatever's on the top of my mind. I, I felt though after hearing about a moon colony since this was the National Space Science, National Space Society Development Conference, I figured there really were a lot of people here who probably were interested in moon colonies and that it would be uh, <coughs> my moral obligation to at least mention moon colonies in my talk since part of my career was built around thinking about moon colonies. And actually, moon colonies have something to do with what I plan to talk about anyway. So I, what I will do in order to make my half hour talk last an hour, which is normally not a problem, I will expand the kind of intro to it to include some stuff that I have done some time ago, because the idea is sort of dovetailed. Uh, what I hope to leave you with today is some sense of context of how people thought about the moon, followed by my commentary and observations about how people ought to be thinking about the moon in the next decade. And I'm, I'm going to make an argument that times are changing and that the role of um, NASA in the space business is very different than even NASA thinks it is and that the next decade may hold some surprises for those of you who believe that things are uh, going as they have in the past. I just missed a one. Sorry. <laughs> the ghost of the past. Um, let's, let's kind of start in the middle of 1981. Now, as I look around this audience, I think most of you were in junior high school in 1981. Is that right? No, no. <laughs> Let me talk about where I was and what I was doing in June of 1981. I, I was uh, at the Johnson Space Center. I was a planetary scientist with a PhD. I was 18 years into my career. I, was, uh, I had an Apollo experiment under my belt, which was really successful, of which I was very proud. It was my PhD thesis. I was engaged in some research, which might be called, uh, uh, if, if I wasn't exactly um, Nobel Prize quality work. I, I was doing what I consider to be decent work in an area which at the time was considered to be sort of peculiar, but now is a hot topic. I was 20 years before my time, unfortunately. But in June of 1981, several external events uh, the space shuttle had just made its first maiden flight with John Young and Bob Crippen at the controls. The space shuttle program was behind schedule and over budget. There was a lot of uh, anxiety in the space agency over promises that had been made about the space shuttle and its uh, role in space and what it actually was turning out to be. Skylab had been allowed to fall to the Earth and incinerate because the shuttle wasn't really ready in time to rescue it. Uh, President Reagan had been elected on a platform of very much less government. I was a government employee. Very much less government meant that I might not have a job. Uh, there was also a space policy which I'm not sure it was in place in, in the middle of 1981, but it was soon to be in place. And it was that the only launch vehicle allowed in the US inventory was the space shuttle. We would basically get rid of all expendable vehicles 
if you had a satellite to take anywhere, you would have to reserve a place on the space shuttle. Um, many of you may not remember that, but that was a fact of life at that time. That was the way the future was shaping up. Um, the, uh, in, President Reagan had not yet named the new NASA administrator, although he had named the NASA deputy <coughs> administrator, who was Hans Mark. Uh, Hans Mark, fresh to the office, but not, not a streaming pilot by any means, uh, had written a memo to his sort of head lieutenants, but of course it was immediately leaked to everybody. And this memo sort of speculated that perhaps NASA needed to really focus on getting the space shuttle up to performance standards, and as a result, things like planetary science should just be stopped and kind of put on hold for, say, a decade or so until the space shuttle was up and running smoothly. Uh, I was a planetary scientist. I was a government employee. I was being hit from several sides. And so um, my organization went into immediate strategic planning mode as to how we're going to react to what looked like a very bleak future uh, for all of us. Uh, the organization to which I belong was created at the Johnson Space Center during the Apollo program and consists of uh, world-class scientists who study rocks, study samples of things. Paul Spudis is a very well-known scientist who looks at data from spacecraft and does analyses from them. The scientists that I work with need something in their laboratory. They're the sort of scientists you might find in a, in a geology department in a university. Of course, in the uh, 70s, they were working on lunar samples. They were, it was the hot topic, really important stuff. Uh, as lunar sample funding kind of went down, they became uh, focused more on meteorites and uh, began to get more involved in other kinds of planetary science. But still, there was a very strong interest in the moon as a research topic. Yet, in the field of planetary science itself, we had moved away from the moon. There was a strong feeling among the scientific community that we had already spent $25 billion and then dollars, $100 billion and now dollars, studying, quote, the moon, unquote, with the Apollo program. And so now it's time to study the rest of the solar system. And those of you interested in the moon could wait a few tens of years. And, but we were very much interested in trying to get a small satellite called a lunar polar orbiter uh, up because it, we thought it would be very inexpensive, and yet it would complete the mapping of an entire planet that the Apollo program had, had begun, initiated, and had spectacular results from, but had only gotten a portion of the data. And it would be the opportunity for planetary scientists to learn about an entire body. Uh, of course, the only way you could get a lunar polar orbiter up at that time was to place it on the space shuttle. So I did. I and a, and a colleague did something which we had really never done before, even in 18 or 20 years at the Johnson Space Center, and that was to walk across the center and talk to engineers. <laughs> there, you would be astounded at the wall within NASA between the scientific part of NASA and the human spaceflight part of NASA. There's just literally no communication. Uh, engineers at the Johnson Space Center would have no idea that there were scientists there and it's, we're, we're still something of a mystery to them after uh, 40 years of existence. Um, and so we, we had a very simple question, how big a satellite could you put on the space shuttle, what would you do? And they said, oh, it would be, you know, you'd probably stick an upper stage on it, something called a PAM. And uh, it turned out you could get quite a large satellite. We were really excited about that. So thought, well, maybe using our influence as insiders, we could get the launch of a lunar polar orbiter and investigate the moon. But you first of all had to talk to people about why would you ever want to do that, and science wasn't always the best reason. One of the things I did learn from these engineers while I was talking to them was that they were thinking about something called a space station, and that uh, beyond the space station, they thought maybe there ought to be uh, rockets at the space station called orbital transfer vehicles. And the whole idea was 
that there was to be a space transportation system run by human beings. And in fact, if you looked in the Johnson Space Center phone book, you didn't find space shuttle, you found space transportation system office. Uh, so I'm sure it was confusing to people on the outside who wanted to try to find out how to phone up the space shuttle, but it, it, it was a, a sign that the thought was there would be a space transportation system that would carry you from the Earth starting from the shuttle, ultimately on the orbital transfer vehicles to other destinations, particularly geostationary orbit where there would be many communication satellites. And then I had discovered from one of the engineers a, a law of physics that I should know but didn't, and that was that by the time you got up to geostationary orbit, you were basically out of the Earth's gravitational field, and that if you just did the transfer a little differently, you could go to the moon with essentially the same amount of energy as you'd go to geostationary orbit. And so, you know, the, the little bell hit over my head, the light bulb went off, and I said, well, if you're building this space transportation system to have routine uh, launches to take satellites to geostationary orbit, why can't we just one day, you know, kind of point the other way a little bit and pick something to the moon? I mean, it would all fit in. And well, they hadn't really thought very much about that. And I said, well, you know, after all, when you do finish this, and it was about 1999 that we were going to finish all this, and we'd all be ready enough and operating. I said, about, I said, you know, about 1999, you're going to be thinking about the next program, aren't you? And I don't know what he had thought about that, because they were only thinking about the next program in 1984. And, and I said, you know, it'd probably be people on the moon. And if you could go to the moon regularly, then that would be a nice thing to do. And, and by the way, you know, you're building these orbital transfer vehicles to carry these communication satellites. Uh, they might be too small to carry people to the moon. Have you ever thought about that? Well, no, they hadn't. And uh, nobody had paid them to think about that. So there was, there was no point in really thinking about it. Um, so that, that didn't seem really logical to us. And, and at that point in time, we started to a, a little campaign first inside the center in order to try to uh, convince people they ought to think about a lunar base, they ought to think about the moon in the future, they ought to be designing their system so that it would have that capacity or at least option in 1999 when it was all up and running. And that, uh, that ought to just be on the agenda. Well, we ran into some difficulties. Um, the first difficulty was that we were told to sit down and shut up. <laughs> and, and here was the reasoning. Uh, NASA is a corporate entity, and any corporate entity is concerned about steady state activity. You don't want to finish something and then have to fire everybody and then start something else and hire everybody back. And of course, in the civil service, this is civil service can't be done anyway. It's, it's bad enough in industry, but it really can't be done in civil service. So if you're, if you're sort of finishing something, which was the space shuttle that had its first flight, and so development of the space shuttle would be kind of moving off, you need to think about the next thing that's coming up. And they kind of looked in their books, and they decided on the space station. And I think they decided on the space station because the space shuttle needed a place to go. And the space station then was a logical next step for the space shuttle, because it would then have some place to go. And then there was this whole idea much further in the background about this space transportation system. And, and they were talking to Congress about the space station, and if some you know, wiseacre stood up and started talking about the moon, Congress might get confused and not wondering, well, what, what is it? Is it the space station or is it the moon? So the best thing for you to do is to sit down and keep quiet until we kind of get all this straightened out. And then later on, we'll, we'll talk about it. Well, um, that didn't sit very well for us with us, and we continued anyway. There's, there's, a, there's a long story behind all this that I don't have time to go into, but what I really wanted to emphasize was the, um, the type of thinking that was going on in NASA at the time, and particularly a problem of, um, of advanced planning in NASA. What we, we had a problem that I referred to as the scarecrow problem. And that is that when the scarecrow went to see the Wizard of Oz, he asked for a brain. And the Wizard 
and said, you don't need a brain, you need credentials. And he hung a medal around his neck and gave him a diploma, and suddenly the scarecrow was qualified to run the Emerald City. Our problem was that nobody knew why we were talking about the moon. In fact, who are you guys? And who authorized you to talk about the moon? Uh, and so what we needed were credentials. And in NASA or the space program, the way you get credentials is to convene a blue ribbon committee to, to talk about whatever it is you're advocating. And so we went, we first of all went to NASA headquarters and talked to the three major parts of NASA headquarters and asked, uh, showed them our idea. And, and the Office of Manned Space Flight Bay, we said, well, that's really interesting. I think you have something there. The problem is that the moon is a planet, and we don't do planets. Um, the space, Office of Space Science does planet. So we went down there, and they said, well, that's a really interesting idea. We think you're thinking along the right lines, but we don't do people. And the, the sending astronauts to the moon is out of our charter. So then we went to the Office of Advanced Technology, and we said, uh, we've got this advanced idea. And they said, well, that's really interesting, but we do technology, we don't do missions. So there was no place in NASA that you could go to and knock on the door and say, you know, I'd like to tell you about this idea. Maybe we can find something in the budget to work on it. Um, so, the, so the idea was legitimization. And in fact, if you went to try to find something that said advanced planning on the door, you always ended up at Ivan Becky's office. And he, he was worried about the space station. So, uh, and the last time there was an office that talked about lunar bases was about 1972. Uh, the last documents I could find all stopped about there. So, so NASA had this problem of, of why should we be talking about the moon? Because in NASA, if you are not part of a funded program, you have a real problem in convincing people that they should pay attention to you. It's a, it's a real serious issue. And in fact, I have to tell a story. Um, I wrote an abstract for the Lunar Planetary Science Conference in 1983 because uh, we had a special session that we put together because we can influence that agenda about returning to the moon. And so I, I wrote a couple of papers, and one of them was uh, a paper that addressed all the reasons that people gave me why we can't never go to the moon again. And it, it was that it's too expensive, it was that uh, we were changing, the, the economy of the world was changing to a service economy when there would actually be never any net growth again the economy would go to zero. In the early 80s, I don't know if you remember, but the growth of the US economy was near zero. And there was a theory that that was the normal state of affairs. And then from now on, we would be at zero. We would never grow again. So you could never do these sorts of things within the budget. Uh, or they would say the Japanese are eating us alive, and we don't, in, in, in terms of economic competition, or they'd say the Russians are feeding us in technology. You, you, there was a whole list of reasons why we would never be able to go to the moon again. So I wrote an abstract with a title about this long that said, why are you talking about the moon when there's never going to be growth in the economy, when the Japanese are feeding us economically, when the Russians have the technology? And then at the last thing, and I said, and when our children are being corrupted by video games. <laughs> and I had a NASA engineer come into my office and tell me that people at the center had seen the title of that abstract. And there was concern that I was discussing video games. <laughs> and the reason was, I was a NASA engineer, and discussing video games had nothing to do with my job. <laughs> so um, fortunately, the next day, and I mean literally the next day, President Reagan appeared at the Air Force Academy. And he gave a speech. And in his speech, he said, you know, our children are playing all these video games, and that's allowing them to hone the skills to fly these jet planes and be war <laughs> And two days later, that same engineer came in my office and he says, you know, you were right. <laughs> it's, some, some days it's a trial. <laughs> anyway, the point was legitimization. And so, so what we did was to come out and form a blue ribbon committee we, and, and by this time, through a series of circumstances that I don't have to go into, we had begun a collaboration with Los Alamos, 
Uh, in terms of planning to go to the moon, and we held a workshop in the spring of 1984 at Los Alamos. Los Alamos was a good place to collaborate with in those days because President Reagan had picked a lot of ex-Los Alamos people to be as part of his uh, national security apparatus, and the key word, the Office of Science Advisor was from Los Alamos, and people high in the National Security Council from Los Alamos. So if you were working with people in Los Alamos at high levels, you had entrees into places that were unusual for NASA engineers. So we conducted a two-step program to legitimize the subject of lunar bases, and that was, and that was an idea actually of, uh, uh, no, he used to be the NASA chief engineer and he was vice president of Lockheed and Burbank. Um, stand. Lowy. Lowy? Yeah, I think so. It, it, anyway, he, the problem was we got a little bit of money and we were in this dilemma. If we, if you really want to get something done, if you want people to think you need a small group. On the other hand, if you want to form an advocacy, you need a large group. And to have, to do one workshop, you can't, do both. It's you know it's contradictory, and so he said it's a two-step process. You hold a secret workshop with a small group of people, and you flesh out the ideas, and then you have a public symposium based on those ideas and open it to everybody. And that's what we did. And the public symposium was the 1984 symposium held at the National Academy of Sciences, which turned it into the book Lunar Bases and Space Activities in the 21st Century. The key thing was that this the themes for scientific research, lunar resource utilization, and settlement as the three things that you would do on the moon or the reason we ought to be thinking about the moon. And the, the word actually used at the workshop was colonization, and I found out very quickly that it's politically incorrect. Because colonization has to do with imperialism and exploitation, and settlement has to do with families and warm feelings and so on. So <laughs> I, I learned very quickly to change that word. Uh, but, but these were pretty advanced concepts for NASA. They could kind of understand scientific research, but this idea of resource utilization still sticks in the craw of people in various places. And settlement in those days was just was something you didn't really want to talk about in an in a actual meeting. You, you would really gloss over it because uh, that was just something that was like science fiction. Um, now, what happened was, of course, that uh, there was a lot of activity that, that was created for various reasons. There were a number of events I don't want to go into because I don't have time. But President Bush made a very important speech in 1980 uh, about it, about going back to the moon and uh, exploration of Mars, finishing the space station, and so on. And that began something in NASA called the Space Exploration Initiative. Now, the Space Exploration Initiative died a fiery political death. And it's really fairly important that we understand why that was. Uh, I don't want to go into, once again, the details of, of the sequence of events, but um, I was at home trying to prepare just a few extra charts for this talk, and I learned the reason why my instruction book says that you should buy special transparencies for inkjet printers. <laughs> what what I want to put on in here is that at this point in time, and in fact still, NASA is profoundly influenced by what I call the Apollo Mega Event. People can write about the Apollo cross program in a number of different parameters in terms of its politics as a Cold War uh, exercise, in terms of its effect on our culture and changing our thinking into a space-faring nation, in terms of its effect on human history that human beings for the first time left the planet and stepped on another one, in terms of technology that there is a NASA became a tech, had the reputation of being a technology engine because of the Apollo program, in terms of the science, some of which you heard in Paul Spudis' talk just ahead of me, there was a profound effect on our thinking about the Earth and its environment and science, and from the fact that we could manage these large, complex projects. After the Apollo project, 
there arose this idea that only in the United States was there the, the skill and technique to be able to manage large complex projects. It's marked on the structure of the US space program as almost indulgent. But, and so therefore it's implicitly assumed in the fact that anything else we do in the future is, will be the same. And that's a theme that I want to base, to address uh, in some detail today. I'm going to talk about something called the Apollo paradigm. And, and by the way, this is based on a couple of papers that I've written, one for the Journal of Aerospace Engineering that appeared in the October 1988 issue, a uh, special issue on lunar development, and a second one that appeared in a workshop in the European Space Agency on uh, using in situ resources that was published, uh, that was held in, in October in Sardinia, that had been published by the European Space Agency. And the Apollo paradigm You have success, which was defined by an event. Now, in relativistic space-time physics, an event has four dimensions, coordinates <coughs> and time. And in this case, it was to land a man on the moon in a place and return him safely to Earth before 1970, a time. So that was the measure of success. And the important thing is that other attributes of the measure of success had secondary importance, such as cost and safety. Now, there's going to be a lot of people that argue with me that we paid a lot of attention to safety and kind of make things as safe as possible. And yes, that's true. But I, I still think that the thinking in Apollo was to do the project on time and to beat the Russians, and that sometimes we didn't think as carefully about safety as we should have. And there are some arguments you can make about that. And this goal was chosen specifically by President Kennedy to have an unknown solution. I mean, that's the reason he picked landing people on the moon, because nobody had done it, and we thought it was far enough down the line that we could get ahead of, of what we thought was a Russian superiority uh, in certain kinds of uh, launch technology. Because it had an unknown solution, the activity was technically complex and risky. <clears throat> Since it's risky and complex, it's extremely expensive to do. And as a consequence, the only place you can find the amount of money to do this event is public funding. So the government has to be managed. It has to be managed by a government agency. And within that government agency, over time, intent and institutional complexity grows. And the reason for that is that there is uh, oversight, public oversight, public eye, federal rules and regulations and so on. So the space program over time, and in fact this is actually a maturing factor in any large organization, becomes more complex and beset by rules. I'm sorry, don't worry about it. Um, another part of the Apollo paradigm has to do with the engineering design. The space environment is a threat and not a resource. Habitats are self-contained cocoons in which the human being should stay. And in fact, they should stay inside them. They should not go outside them. Mission designers hate for astronauts to go EVA, particularly in the old days. For astronauts on Apollo to actually go out on the surface and do things, it's frowned upon. Now, the only reason that has changed is because it's been driven by the space station problems of design recently to where, how many EVAs are there now? Uh, the 600. About 600 EVAs in the construction of the space station. But believe me, in Apollo, that would never have been thought of. The mission duration has to be minimized in order to contain the risk because only bad things can happen to you in space. The longer you stay, the more bad things can happen. And in fact, Earth is the only safe haven. And these ideas <coughs> dominated the way that people thought about um, the human space program and particularly ideas about the moon. Now, uh, for those of you who wanted to see something about a moon colony, I have a few slides. Uh, this was the idea at the time that we were moving in space transportation, going from airliners to the space shuttle. Next, please. These slides are about 1983, they're about 
picture of the shuttle launching from the Earth next. Uh, a space station with a Hubble Space Telescope and so on there next. Uh, orbital transfer vehicle showing a kind of a turtle design here, Turtle 2, NASA Turtle 2, next with each shield and so on. Uh, assembly of the space station of these orbital transfer vehicles taking payloads to higher orbits. Next slide, please. Uh, two orbital transfer vehicles ganged up to take a module and its landing stage to the moon. Next slide, please. Going to the moon, releasing it, and then these orbital transfer vehicles return to the space station. Next slide. Modules landed on the surface and picked up by an astronaut put on the surface. Now, I want to point out something to you here, and that is the idea is here that the habitats are self-contained, they're metal cylinders that drive from the space station and they're placed out on a flat plane. You can see some dirt being piled up for radiation protection out here. But this is the sort of standard way to fuel lunar base. You see a nuclear power plant here with the radiators from the nuclear power sources. And you see the landscape littered with stages of landed stages all over the place that have come down and have had their payloads removed and, and carted over to the base. Next slide, please. And then, then at such a base, you would perhaps use resources of some kind in order to, in this case, create lunar oxygen. And uh, next slide, please. So the whole schematic is this whole space transportation system. Shuttle to the space station, OTVs to the moon, down to the moon, and so on. Now, now why, why did it look like this? It looked like that because in order to get any hearing in the space station see at all in, in mid-80s, you had to show them that you were part of the team. In other words, you were going to use the space station. The space station had a role in this picture. And this was sort of the standard picture until the late 80s. And when the space exploration initiative took hold and, and people began to start with a clean sheet of paper, the preferred solutions actually didn't involve the space station. And the space station was designed really for other purposes than to be a transportation node. It was designed, designed much more, the current space station is designed much more to be a research laboratory than anything involved in transportation payloads. Okay, uh, next slide. The, the idea of lunar bases is to have all sorts of, of different sorts of, uh, uh, this, is, this is a mass driver that you've heard about when you launch payloads in the space. Let me, let me go back one slide, Brian. One of the problems, one of the cost drivers in this uh, scenario is really the cost of launch from low Earth orbit. And, and all of you who are in the space program are familiar, who follow the space program are familiar with this issue of launch cost. Uh, we could never come up with good estimates or, or really believable estimates of how much things would cost. And so what we would use for a surrogate of cost was the number of launches required to complete some particular scenario. And the idea was that launch cost was so expensive that it, it dominated the cost of building the infrastructure and operations and so on. So you would, you would measure the goodness or the expensiveness of your scenarios by how many shuttle launches it took to do something. And the measure was that if you wanted to land one ton on the moon in this kind of a scenario, you would have to launch seven tons from the Earth. Therefore, the cost of a lunar launch was seven times the cost of an Earth launch. And if the Earth launch was $5,000 a pound or whatever it was your number at the time, it would be $35,000 a pound or whatever your number was at the time. And, and, but when you analyze this scenario and you say, what is being carried back and forth to the moon? Uh, the, the simple answer would be, oh, you're carrying scientific experiments, or you're carrying people, or you're carrying hardware. No, 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 no. You're carrying oxygen. It turns out that the hydrogen oxygen engines that were required to be used in this scenario, the principal mass, the totally dominant mass of what's being carted around in space is oxygen. And so what we 
realized early on, and I mean by 1983, late, late 1983, was that if you could somehow have a gas station over here that supplied the oxygen and was waiting for you, that you could reduce this cost because you would need fewer launches in this space. Uh, it turned out just by being able to fuel this lander that just would go up and down here, only fueling that lander would reduce by half the cost of this scenario, reduced by half the cost of this uh, of the number of launches in space. And so we began looking hard at this idea of making oxygen on the moon by some scheme. Because if you you would have to invest in the capital infrastructure to place it on the moon and the operations of it, but in theory, in the long run, it would pay for itself. And that's where the whole idea of in-situ resource <coughs> utilization came from. That was the birth of that idea. Now, people got confused. They thought that that was the reason we were going to the moon to make oxygen. No. If you don't have this system, making oxygen doesn't help you. So the reason you're making oxygen is to make this system more efficient, and this system has to exist for some other reason. And that was really a hard one to deal with. I wrote papers called Lunar Based Why Ask Why, things like that. The whole idea was that managers, when they were thinking about these future scenarios, wanted the very first chart in their presentation after the title chart to be a rationale. Why are we going to the moon? And they wanted, in particular, two bullets on that chart that would convince Congress and everybody else that it was a good idea. Well, not so simple. And it turns out that when you really look at the reason we're going to the moon, you end up backing yourself up into philosophical space, which is human beings are going to leave the Earth someday, and the moon is part of that, and we need to think in broader terms and not think about that we're going to the moon to make oxygen or to mine, whatever it is. And, and so people got caught in that scenario. Now, to this day, to this day, people in NASA have trouble <coughs> buying this idea of resource utilization. I won't say the name, but during the Space Exploration Initiative, there was a, a review about it. Oh, two thirds of the way through the exercise, there were, there were some assumptions that needed to be clarified, and so the, the, the graybeards were called in to the Vanguard building to come and consult, and we were asked what kind of assumptions did you make. So there were presentations being made. And so engineer got up to make the presentation about the in situ resource utilization, and a senior NASA manager was sitting there, and he you know, didn't react. The engineer started talking. He says, "Excuse me, what what is this about?" And they said, "Well, this is in situ research utilization. So what does that mean?" He says, "Well, it's about making oxygen on the moon in order to lower the cost." And he just erupted. He says, "That is the stupidest idea I have ever heard." Now, the reason it was the stupidest idea he ever heard is because in NASA, chemical engineering in this form, process engineering, is a foreign technology. If you go to pump oil and refining company bring people who spend a lot of money into your room and you talk about making oxygen on the moon and you explain the processes, Sabatier processes, the hydrogen reduction, the like, whatever it is you're going to do, they say, this is child's play. What you're talking about is trivial stuff. But nobody's ever going to go to the moon. If you go to the NASA engineer, they say, oh, going to the moon is simple. But making this stuff work there can never be done. <laughs> so there's a constant problem of, of communication across technology fields. The whole field of planetary science was invented because astronomers and geologists did not have talked to one another in, the, in their language when they were studying the moon. So the field of planetary science was created and now people talk in terms of astronomy, in terms of remote sensing, in terms of geology, and, and there's a, a vocabulary, a common vocabulary. That vocabulary does not yet exist in terms of space utilization and so on. So, so the idea of resources in space is very foreign to the, the thinking in the standard Apollo paradigm, which 
space is a threat and not a resource. Um, let's go on to the next slide. I'll just show a few lunar race scenes for those who came for that. Next slide, please. <laughs> oh, one more. This, this is a child who's sitting with his dad, so you get the idea that it's a, that a future face. And this is a video flyer wagon that he's dragging along. And in there is Alan Shepard's golf ball. I don't know if any of you ever noticed that. <laughs> next, next slide. Uh, another view of a lunar base out of the 1984 summer workshop. Uh, NASA help to look at the utilization of the moon. Next slide. This is a Japanese view from NASA, the Japanese Space Agency. Notice the standard form of modules flying on a flat lunar plane. Next slide. This is out of a study at JSC a number of years ago, but an inflatable habitat. We now fight over the transhab, but this was one of the first times that inflatable brought back into the thinking inside NASA. Next slide. This is a lunar hotel from the Obayashi Corporation in Japan. Next slide. And then these are ideas that come out of the Encyclopedia Britannica in just like the early 70s where they're tunneled to the side. And I particularly like this one. It solves a lot of problems that we would have if we put those things out on the plane. The point is that I want to make is that lunar bases used to be 10 years ago, 15 years ago, really exotic things. Working on a lunar base, wow. I wrote an article for Ad Astra last year where I pointed out that now there are so many papers on lunar bases at international conferences and student conferences and so on. And you should read them, you kind of, it's no fun anymore. I mean, you get the same kinds of solutions. There are kind of standard solutions. We need to work make sure that we understand both the moon environment and that those things will work on the moon. But the idea that you can create some kind of new gizmo that will solve the problem of human habitation on the moon is really a, a false hope. Okay, let's let's get down to the meat of my talk. Let's turn on the slide right there. Um, what I really came to talk to you about was this. The Apollo paradigm, which has dominated NASA, in my mind, needs to be broken. And we had an event in NASA in 1992, after the, the um, failure of the Space Exploration Initiative, called Dan Golden. And Dan Golden has created a lot of change in the agency, uh, and there's a lot of controversy about him as a person and so on, but one of the things that he has done is to bring back to the agency a vision of human exploration of space. He really has a personal vision, and he has people who have no money to work on it, but they at least are, are assigned to think about it. Uh, and they report to him and talk to him about it, about how we're going to go to the moon and how we're going to go to Mars. They have taken the ideas of the Space Exploration Initiative and they have honed them in an attempt to reduce the mass that you lift off of the Earth in order to do these missions. One of the problems with the scenarios created in the Space Exploration Initiative was that step one was build a big rocket, resurrect the Saturn V, uh, use the energy, uh, create the Shuttle C, uh, build the Magnum, whatever the solution was. And build a big rocket, in NASA's terminology, is a few billion dollar exercise. And quite frankly, guys, nobody's going to give us a few billion dollars anymore. Uh, the second coming of Apollo will not happen. And so that just stymied everything. But if you can reduce the mass to come down to some rocket that we do have, then you maybe have some choice, chance of putting down the scenarios. And the people at Johnson who've been working in this are working toward that aim. They've been very innovative. And but they have discovered that about the only way you can bring down the mass is to depend on resources at your destination, i.e., in situ resource utilization. But let me tell you, even though in situ resource utilization is in the plans for the human missions to Mars that you can look at on the web. 
and in the latest addendum published last year, there has very recently been a team assigned by High Level Management and Center to solve the problem the Apollo way, not use these crazy resources. And right now, I think their entry mass at Mars is 108 metric tons. Uh, and they don't seem to be able to come in, down into the mass range we need with those old ideas. The point I want to make is that old ideas do not die easily. And, the, and there's good reason for it, because people had success with that mode of operation. Their careers were built on it. Their forefathers' careers were built on it. And if you change, you're taking risks, and nobody likes to take risks. And these technologies, as I said, are foreign technologies. OK. Well, the second thing that's happened is, is that <coughs> Dan Golden is concentrating on human missions to Mars. And that's what the people at the Johnson & Johnson are thinking about. If you listen to a Dan Golden speech, and you get the question and answers afterwards, you will find that there are about five questions that he is ready for because he always gets them, and one is, when are we going to build the lunar base? And his answer to that, which is, which is a legitimate answer, is that he's concerned from a programmatic point of view that if we say we want to go to Mars, but by the way, we've got to go to the moon first, or some reason, that the whole, there'll be a whole institutional industrial complex built around lunar activities with an investment in it and lobbying efforts to maintain them and we will then be locked in to this place here and never get off the mark, at least within lifetimes that we're interested in. And so he's very wary of going to the moon. And therefore, in the NASA scenarios, going to the moon at least is not in place right now. There, there's, there are some interesting things going on as I speak about rethinking the whole general problem. But let me just say that as three months ago, going to the moon was just not in the cards in, in the scenarios. So in some sense, and, and by the way, NASA has not launched a moon mission since, I guess, Apollo. Now you say, oh, wait a minute, what about lunar prospecting? Uh, what about Clementine? Clementine was not a NASA mission. It was a mission generated within the military. NASA hooked on to it. There was a lot of blood over that. Lunar Prospector was not a NASA mission. It is part of what's called the Discovery Program, where scientific teams put in proposals for missions, and they're picked partly on scientific merit, but with a heavy emphasis on cost efficiencies. And the Lunar Polar Orbiter mission only cost about $63 million. And it was so much lower than anything else submitted to the Discovery mission that it got accepted. <laughs> So the fact that it's flying to the moon has no relevance to NASA's intent in the future. And a lot of people overseas that talk to me get confused about that. So in some sense, NASA has basically opted out of going to the moon. On the other hand, we see a lot of other kind of activity around here. Uh, Denise Norris is around with Applied Space Resources. Various uh, Greg Bennett's around here, part of the Artemis project. Other people are around who are thinking about various kinds of privately financed projects to go to the moon. And in fact, a new thing, a new uh, environment has arisen. Uh, a year or two ago, I think uh, last year, a magazine devoted to futurist studies polled its readers who were futurists at universities and asked several questions. One of them was, when do you think the first year will be that um, commercial launches to space will outnumber government launches to space. And the, the consensus was the year 2018. The actual year is 1997. Uh, there is a telecommunications revolution going on that I'm sure you're all aware of. Wall Street now considers it fair game to invest in space telecommunications. If you look on the uh, Department of Transportation's website, you'll find that they predict something like 1,400 satellites may be launched in the next decade to lower orbit. In parallel, there is a real competition of sending satellites to geostationary orbit, and all the slots are taken. There's no more room at geostationary orbit. What do you do? Well, you make the satellites there then more complicated to do more functions for the slot you do have, and those satellites are getting bigger and bigger. 
and there is in the private sector a drive now to build larger launch vehicles. The Ariana 5 is being expanded. The Delta IV is on the drawing boards. The engines are being tested as we speak, and it'll be flying as soon as the Delta III gets fixed. Uh, the Delta IV will be flying in about 2005 or so. And meanwhile, there's a whole bunch of companies that are spending their own money in the form of hundreds of millions of dollars on building reusable launch vehicles. Uh, privately financed, not NASA financed. Uh, Andrew Beal from Beal Aerospace testified in front of Congress just uh, a few days ago. Uh, Kistler Aerospace, uh, Kelly Aerospace, um, Pioneer Rocket Plane. Um, it goes on and on. I mean, there's, there's, there's several of them. Now, and, and then Lockheed's building the X-33, which is a reusable launch vehicle, and you know, the Venture Star will hopefully be one. So suddenly there is a whole bunch of private money we're putting into launch vehicles. Why? Because they see a market in this telecommunications revolution. And their idea is the capitalist's dream. We will build a launcher which is less expensive to operate and that can capture that market. And then because we have this launcher available, the market will grow and more people will launch telecommunications satellites and then we'll build more launchers and we'll all be rich. There's a little bit of a catch there in the sense that low Earth orbit is a limited resource. There's something called orbital debris up there that people, I don't think, have thought through entirely. And my modeling that I've done on it shows that in about 10 years, uh, if we don't do anything about it, we're going to start to see events that make us a little wary of low Earth orbit. And in particular, uh, it might be deemed a place dangerous to put humans, and I consider that part of my significant scenario in the next decade, that uh, the space station will end its political lifetime in about uh, the end of the next decade, and the question will be, what do we do with human beings and human exploration? The question is, do we make the space station bigger and enlarge it? I really think the orbital three problem will preclude that. We'll be looking to go elsewhere in space. At the same time now, we've got this private investment in space, both in terms of infrastructure and in terms of launch vehicles. Uh, the commercial market, the Delta IV, will actually have the capability around 2005 to start to carry out some of the human missions to Mars scenarios that are now on the books at the Johnson Space Center. And suddenly, you don't have to build a Magnum anymore. Well, you know, that's beginning to dawn on people. So suddenly, maybe some of the human exploration missions that we have, that we're beginning to hone down the mass, will be capable of being launched on commercial launch vehicles. In addition, uh, I think the orbital debris problem is going to drive the whole satellite infrastructure in low Earth orbit to higher orbits. I also have noticed recently that a satellite called AsiaSat was launched by a Proton had the failure to put it in geostationary trans transfer orbit useless. It was written off by the insurers. Hughes came to the insurers and said, may we use your satellite? And they took the coal nitrogen thrusters on that satellite, the little tiny two jiggers that do station keeping. They pumped them until the satellite went around the moon twice and then came back and settled in an orbit at 10 degrees uh, inclination near the equator satellite was then open for service. That event was a tremendous psychological event. I think it brought the moon onto the spreadsheet of the private sector. No longer is the moon a distant remote object. The moon is somehow part of the game, at least gravitationally at first, and maybe in other ways. Um, my sense is that within the next 10 years, oh, oh, the other thing is, Uh, launch vehicle developers. Uh, 
Uh, there's already been studies to show that you know a small number of people be willing to pay a million dollars to go into space. A larger number of people would be willing to pay a hundred thousand dollars to go into space. You and I might be willing to pay five thousand dollars to go into space. And then the question is. What will they do besides just the experience of touching on space and floating a little bit? Well, Mr. Bigelow and Bigelow Aerospace seems to think maybe they want to be in a hotel. And Shimizu already has its cartoon up about a hotel in space. So suddenly the things that were considered to be so far out as to be illegitimate subjects for discussion within the space program are being bandied about in the private sector. And what is being broken is the Apollo paradigm. We suddenly have that, that space exploration is no longer, it is getting to the point where it is no longer so technologically risky and complex that only governments can do it. We find it then being exploited by the private sector. We will have some difficulties with laws, regulations, legal liabilities, private property rights, a number of issues that right now seem remote to us. But I see within the next 10 years a commercial expansion into space that will be touching the moon. And I think that human beings who go to the moon and do things next may well be wearing company logos rather than NASA logos. Well, what does NASA do in this situation? I mean, NASA considers itself to be the owner of human spaceflight and human exploration. And I sense that any institution that gets, quote, threatened, unquote, in its major role will respond. And I think that NASA will find a way to get in front of the parade rather than not be in the parade at all. And part of it will be enabled by the fact that you can buy certain services off the shelf commercially, and that all ties into the real threat of legislation going on in the Congress today, forcing NASA to buy more and more commercial services. So I can't tell you exactly what will happen, but I can tell you what a couple of the watershed events will be. Look for the first business that exists in space and sells services to other things in space. Suddenly then space will become an economy in the sense that a, an undeveloped country it has an economy. To me, that will be the watershed event when economies start to nucleate for in-space services and activities. What will be that in-space service? I don't know. It might be a power satellite that beams power to other satellites, not to the Earth. It might be a police force. There's a lot of problems in geostationary orbit. It might be a retrieval service either for deorbiting large chunks of things or recovering satellites of some kind. I don't know what it will be. But when that occurs, that will be, I think, the nucleating event that will suddenly turn space into an economy as opposed to some kind of remote exotic horizon. And I think that ultimately people will have a large role to play in it. And I think we'll see it before 2010. Thank you.